Have you ever done something that other people would consider crazy, but you were just willing to do it because you're that passionate about it? Uh, maybe you're a hunter and you're willing to get up well before dawn and go out in the snow and the cold in order to to get your buck. Uh, or maybe you've got another something else that's that's your thing that other people just don't understand, but you're willing to be a little crazy uh, because you're passionate about it. Today we're continuing our look at First and Second Timothy, these letters that were written by Paul to Timothy, and Paul is encouraging Timothy to take heart, to be courageous, to be encouraged, and he knows that it's going to involve looking crazy to the rest of the world. We're going to pick up with 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with 14. Paul says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul here talks about the the scriptures. He says Timothy has grown up in the his mother, his grandmother were Jewish, and so he's grown up in the Jewish faith, and when he heard about Jesus, he realized that he was the Messiah that the Jewish people had been waiting for, the one who would save his people. And so from the time he was very young, he was taught the scriptures, what we would call today the Old Testament. And he knew them, and he had learned about God's nature, about God's character, and about the ways that God had acted in the world and would act in the world. And Paul says, remember that. Remember that even when the world thinks you're crazy. Remember that. He goes on to say that all scripture is God-breathed. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, this doesn't mean that we as human beings always understand it correctly. Sometimes we, we miss things. Sometimes we've been taught in ways that were wrong or we haven't seen other connections. Sometimes we pull out one verse and we just focus on it and we miss the rest of the verses around it that really give it context and that help us to understand its meaning accurately. I think one of those verses is Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, I love this verse. It's the one that says, For I know the plans I have for you, said, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, maybe if you've heard that verse, you've uh, had somebody share it with you as you were trying to discern God's will for your life or maybe uh, make an important decision or be, find encouragement as you were looking for a vocation or a career. And certainly God has used that in people's lives to encourage us in that way. But primarily what he's saying here is not about an individual promise to any one of us. This was not spoken to one individual, but it was spoken to all of the people of Israel. What he is not saying there is that by, by prosper, that God will prosper us. It doesn't mean that you will have an easy life. It doesn't mean that you'll enjoy material blessings, that you'll have plenty of money and a nice house, or that things will go the way that you anticipate them to go. This verse is not a promise to any one person, but it's a promise to all of Israel. And when we look at the next verse and the next few verses, we see some context that gives us a different window into how we can and should understand this. God there was speaking to the people of Israel and he says, I will prosper you. I have plans for you as a nation and I will redeem you. But first, you're going to go into exile. You're going to go into exile for 70 years. But I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. This was a promise to the people of Israel. This looks like a far cry from what we often think of when we think that God will prosper us. 
So we need to be careful when we share that with people and we don't want people to, to found their hope on the, this as a promise that God will give them financial prosperity or a career that they find satisfying because sometimes careers don't end up the way we think they should. Sometimes marriages fall apart and we want to make sure that people's faith is secure in that time. So we have to look at the context of a verse and not just its individual verse. But all scripture is God-breathed. As Paul was writing these words to Timothy, he did not know that those words would become a part of what we now call the New Testament. Those letters and teachings that the church has found to be inspired by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. The scriptures, the Old Testament and the New, are God-breathed. But look at the next part here. It says the, there, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. These words are for us to put into action. It's not just for us to, to learn and to spend time growing in our understanding of the Bible. We can study the Bible all we want. We can learn the original languages and we can see the syntax and how different verses fit together. But if we don't apply it to our lives, we are wasting our time. Scripture is powerful for us to be equipped to serve God, for us to be better able to love the people around us as we love God. And so we're called to, to be equipped to do these good works. Scripture is God's word. We need to work to properly understand it. To We can consume it. We spend time studying it and, and let it shape us and understand it so that we can be equipped to do every good work. Paul continues in chapter 4. He says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Preach the word. I believe here that Paul is not just talking about, about getting up in front of people and presenting a sermon, but he's talking about the ways that we live our lives that preaches the word of Jesus Christ, the love of God. He says, preach the word in season and out of season. As I'm preaching this, we've just finished the, the, the NFL season. The Super Bowl was last weekend. And, you know, there are a couple different ways that players approach the offseason. Oh, you know, there are some who continue to work out. They continue to watch what they eat. They continue to, uh, to study the playbooks and things like that, knowing that there's going to be another season coming in just a few months. But then every year... Come the beginning of the season, you hear stories about some players who didn't take that approach. You know, they ate whatever they wanted to, and they partied, and they pretended like there was nothing left to do. And so some of them, sometimes especially you'll see that maybe in college more so than the pros, you see somebody who reports to camp and then they, they gained a lot of weight and not in muscle mass and they're not able to, to last through a full four quarter game come September. And then you can compare that to somebody like Eric Weddle. Now, in the Super Bowl, if you watched it this year in 2022, you might have heard Weddle's story. He played for the Rams, the Los Angeles Rams, and he retired in 2019, after the 2019 season. And he had, uh, he had been off for those two years, but then there were injuries to the Rams towards the end of their season, uh, the 2021 season, and so they signed him to a contract at the end of the season for the playoffs this year. And so he had been off for two full years and he was 37 years old and he comes back and he plays again. And, and apparently he was still in good enough shape to be able to, to run with the best wide receivers in the game. And now he's a Super Bowl champion. 
because of the ways that he lived his life in that extended off season. Here Paul says, preach the script, the word in season and out of season. Paul is encouraging Timothy and us to live our lives urgently because we never know how close we are to the final days and when Jesus will return. And so we are to take heart. We're to keep the faith. We're to share that faith with others. And we're to love the people around us. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement, uh, that we're a part of that, that stream of the history of the church. And he told his preachers that they were to be ready to preach, pray, or die at a moment's notice. They had to be ready at any time to be able to give a word of encouragement and challenge to people or to pray and to lead others in prayer or even to give their lives for the sake of the gospel. Be ready to preach the word in season and out of season. And there is an out of season. We often don't think about that, but there are times when we preach and people don't respond time where we serve and people take advantage of us and times where we love and people hate us in response but still we do it preach the word in season and out of season paul continues in verse three he says for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. I love that phrase, those itchy ears. And sometimes our, our ears, we, we want to hear what we want to hear. And Paul here says there, there will come a time. Now, I don't think he was just talking about 2,000 years from when he was writing, and then we're just now experiencing it for the first time. I think he was talking about Timothy's ministry in the church in Ephesus, that he experienced that. People wanting to chase after what they wanted to hear. And it has happened in every generation of the church since then. And certainly we experience that today. Our algorithms and social media are designed specifically for our itching ears to hear what we want to hear because that's what produces more ad revenue and more clicks. We have to be careful that we don't just listen to what we want to hear, but we listen to sound doctrine, to strong teaching. We don't turn aside from that to myths. Now, Remember what Paul said just a, a moment ago in chapter 3, verse 14. He said, continue in what you have learned. Timothy had learned from solid, compassionate teachers of the word of God. And he knew its reality and its truthfulness. He didn't have to look for something that was novel or new or chase after the latest theology fad. He was to continue in what he knew to be the truth. The word continue here is the same word that is translated as remain in John chapter 15. As Jesus is speaking and he says, remain in me and I will remain in you as a branch remains in the vine. He's calling us to continue not only in our sound doctrine and in studying the scriptures, but to continue in that relationship of connection with Jesus Christ. The word to us is to continue to remain in the truth, to continue to remain in Christ, the true word. In verse 5, Paul continues, But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Keep your head in all situations. Those words are not just for Timothy 2,000 years ago, but they are for us today. As we face stresses and pressures and challenges, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardships. Be willing to suffer to do what is right. Do the work of an evangelist, sharing the love of Jesus with people who don't know him. 
You don't have to stand on a street corner and preach to people as they're walking by. But love the people that God has placed in your life, especially those who don't know him. Do the work of an evangelist. And continue to discharge all the duties of your ministry. Now, Timothy was a, a pastor of a church in Ephesus. But these words are not just for those who are ordained for the ministry. Because elsewhere, Paul talks about the duties of the ministry being the ministry of all believers. When you put your faith in Christ, you were called into a good work to do for him. You were called into the ministry. Paul says, continue to do the work of the ministry that you've been called to. Throughout First and Second Timothy, Paul is constantly talking about the importance of doing good works. He talks about that to Timothy personally. He says that that's a requirement for anyone who is an elder or a deacon in the church. And he talks about how the widows who are receiving support from the church, they are to continue to do good works as well. We do good works because of what God has done for us. And we continue to do those good works even in the face of suffering as we endure hardships. We give when we don't have much to give. We speak love to people when they're coming back at us with anger or hate. We endure hardships as we do the good works of the ministry that God has called us to. I don't know if you've heard of William Carey, uh, but he dedicated his life to advancing the kingdom of God in India. And he started there in the 1790s. And for the first six years of his ministry, he faced incredible setbacks. He ran out of money. He and his family didn't have enough food. They didn't have adequate housing. They repeatedly had to move in order to find a, a new place to live where they could survive even without money. Uh, they moved five times in seven months and one stretch. His son nearly died. They had dysentery and other sicknesses. And on top of that, they were, all, they were isolated from other Christians. There were no other believers to encourage or to talk with in the areas where they were. So on top of all of this, during this whole time, he did not see a single person put their faith in Christ. So he was preaching the word and not seeing any response or any fruit. But still, he persisted in the work. Eventually, he became known as the father of modern missions. William Carey's work was motivated by an unswerving belief in the gospel. Eventually, he would help translate the scriptures into six different languages. Now, if you ever took high school Spanish, you know how hard it is to learn one language. And he took the scriptures and translated them into six languages in India. And over the course of his ministry, he saw hundreds of people put their faith in Christ as well. But ultimately, he said it was only because he persevered, because he was willing to endure hardships that maybe would have driven other people away. He persevered. You endure hardships. Do the work of an evangelist and continue to do the duties of the ministry to which God has called you. Let's pray. God, we're humbled that you want to use us in this world, but we thank you for it. So we pray today that you would encourage us, help us to experience your grace and to share that with those around us. Help our witness to be strong to people who don't know you, Help us to be driven by your love. Lord, we pray that your spirit will empower us to do these things. In your name, amen.